So hello and welcome to this tutorial. I'm hoping to take you through the steps that you would need to first draw a two-dimensional Lewis structure for a covalently bonded molecule and then to take that structure and represent it three-dimensionally. The Vesper structure that we're going to take a look at today is uh, one of the more common ones, but I want you to focus on the procedure and the steps. This one too is a little bit trickier than you might first expect. So if you want to go through and draw this yourself initially, great, but uh, I think you might want to stick around to the end just to verify that your structure is correct. Okay, so the first thing that we are going to do is recognize that this is a covalently bound structure. Uh, it's a phosphorus bound to four oxygen. We see that between phosphorus and oxygen, there are going to be covalent bonds formed. So this is not something that's going to display or represent the movement of electrons. Rather, we are going to use a Lewis structure that indicates that there is a sharing of electrons. Um, you can't see my fingers there, but that was in parentheses. Anyway, we are going to first start by counting the number of valence electrons that we have to play with. And again, it's the valence electrons. So if I do my electron count, I can see for phosphorus, based on the periodic table, that I'm going to have five electrons. In terms of what oxygen brings, I have four oxygen that each have six valence electrons. So that gives me a total of 24 valence electrons contributed by all of the oxygen. And in terms of the extra electrons that I have, I have three extra electrons. We have to remember that this three minus gives us three additional electrons that we did not have otherwise. So the total number of electrons that we have here, if we take a look at all of this, is 32 total electrons for this structure. Now the next step that we are going to take is to take the phosphorus and place it at the center. Why the phosphorus? Well, if we just look at the formula, you can see that it makes sense that the phosphorus is the central atom, but typically we put the one with the lowest electronegativity or the largest bonding capacity uh, at the center, the exception being that we never put hydrogen at the center. So I'm going to put phosphorus in the middle. I'm going to place the oxygen all around the phosphorus, because I have four oxygen, I'm going to put one oxygen in each of the poles, so to speak, the north, south, east, west. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line in between the central phosphorus and each of the peripheral or outer oxygen. This line indicates a shared pair of electrons, that is two electrons that I have used up of my 32 electrons. So here I have two, four, six, eight electrons that I have used up. Now if you want to keep track of this, you can subtract those eight electrons that you have there. And as a result, we now have 24 electrons that we have remaining. And I'm going to use up those 24 electrons right now by doing the next step, which is to take any extra electrons and fill the octets of the outer elements. So we can see that oxygen, having two electrons from the shared bond with phosphorus, now needs six electrons more in order to satisfy its octet. And that's true for each of the other oxygens. Now it just so happens I have 24 electrons left. I need to give each of the four oxygens six electrons, and that works out. I have used up all of my electrons. Now I should note that if I had any electrons left over, I would place them around the central atom. If I was deficient in electrons, meaning I didn't have enough electrons to occupy or satisfy my oxygen, I would start having to use double bonds. But I neither have a double bond scenario here, just yet, nor do I have a, an extra amount of electrons to place around that central atom. What I do have, though, is a polyatomic ion, and so as a result, I have to place a square bracket around the polyatomic ion and include the charge. So this would be the structure of a phosphate ion, the two-dimensional structure of a phosphate ion. So now what we have to do is if we are going to represent this in its three-dimensional structure, we have to first recognize what its molecular class is. What I have here is an A, central atom, X, the peripheral atom, 4. So my molecular class is an AX4. Now if you're just first learning the molecular classes and their shapes, you could look this up, but I know that an AX4 is tetrahedral. So the way that I'm going to represent this is as a tetrahedral shape. I have my central phosphorus, I have one of my oxygen projecting outwards out of the plane of paper, and that's where this triangle comes in. I have another one of my oxygen projecting backwards, and I have one, two in the plane of the paper. So with that done, 
This would be the three-dimensional structure of a tetrahedral polyatomic ion like phosphate. So this molecule that I'm going to show you here is not phosphate, this is methane, but you can see that it has the same type of structure that our phosphate molecule has. And the way that we've oriented it, the way that we've drawn it is like this, so that we have these two bonds that are in the same plane of the paper, or the same plane of the screen that you're looking on now. We have one projecting outward towards the viewer, and we have one projecting backwards uh, away from the viewer or into the plane of paper. And so this is the orientation that we are trying to draw on a two-dimensional plane like this piece of paper to represent a three-dimensional, in this case, polyatomic ion. And if we were to include some additional information on this, we would say that we have a bond angle here of 109.5, which is the characteristic bond angle for tetrahedral molecules between adjacent peripheral atoms. If you drew this two-dimensional structure, uh, kudos, because it matches mine, but if you looked up the actual structure of the phosphate ion on the internet, it would not look like that. It would look like this. Now, how do we know that the structure of the phosphate ion is actually like this and not like this? Well, it has to do with something called formal charge. And there are different ways that you can go through and calculate formal charge. There is a formula in order to figure out formal charge, but I have found the best way to do it is to think about it like this. Formal charge is the charge that we assign to something when it is bonded. And it takes into account the number of electrons that it has when it is unbonded, or the number of valence electrons that it has when it's unbonded, and the number of electrons associated with it when it bonds. So, to visualize that, if we take a look at phosphorus, right now phosphorus has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight associated with it, but each of these electrons are shared with an oxygen. So what we do, or what I do, in order to figure out formal charge is I draw a circle, and you're going to notice that this circle surrounds the phosphorus, but it also bisects each of the bonds that involves oxygen. So, what that means is now everything that's inside this circle is associated with the phosphorus. That means the phosphorus has four electrons associated with it in this compound. But, the phosphorus brought five electrons, meaning it's down an electron. So we would say that its formal charge is plus one. If we take a look at each of the oxygen, and I'm only going to draw a circle around one of the oxygen because they're all the same in terms of the number of lone electrons that they have and the number of bonded electrons that they have, this oxygen, or each oxygen in this case, brought six electrons, six valence electrons. But if we take a look at each of these oxygens, they actually have seven electrons associated with them. The six lone electrons and one electron from the bond with phosphorus. So it actually has one more electron than it started with. So we would say that this is a negative one formal charge, and that each of these have a negative one formal charge. And if we did all of our formal charges correctly, that all of those charges should add up to the overall charge in the polyatomic ion. If this was a neutral molecule, all of the formal charges would cancel out and leave us with zero. But in this case, we have four negative ones, and we have one positive one, so all of that does add up to three minus in this case. So the way that we use formal charge is we try and get as many of those values as close to zero as possible. Now they can't all be zero because this is a polyatomic ion. But now let's take a look at another way of representing this structure that might satisfy formal charge and some of the images that you might find on the internet. Now I'm going to start off in very much the same way by placing four oxygen around the phosphorus. I'm going to draw a single bond between three of the oxygen and fill them up with those electrons. But what I'm going to do with the other oxygen now is I'm actually going to put a double bond there. And if we take a look at this now, and I draw my circle around the phosphorus, notice now that there are one, two, three, four, five bonds that phosphorus shares with oxygen. And so as a result, phosphorus has a formal charge of zero. This oxygen, has six electrons associated with it, two from the double bond with phosphorus and then two lone electron pairs. It has six electrons, it brought six, ele six electrons, it has a formal charge of zero. This oxygen is like the other three remaining oxygen in that it has six electrons that it brought, seven electrons it's associated with at this point, and so it has a formal charge of minus one, minus one and minus one. 
Now the purpose of formal charge is to try and acquire as many values as close to zero as possible. And we have to remember here that it's not possible for them all to be zero because this is a polyatomic ion and all of these formal charges will have to add up to this charge. And so we can see here that we have three negative one formal charges which will match up with our three minus charge. We have more values that are close to zero than the diagram that we had before. So this structure is actually a more likely structure for the phosphate ion because it satisfies the formal charge. Now, do you have to do this for every single structure to make sure that it's done correctly? No, that is not my expectation. That is not my expectation for my students. But the reason that I do bring this forth is because sometimes when students go to verify their structures on the internet, they see structures that are not in line with what they normally believe those structures to be, even though they believe they have drawn the structure correctly. So you will notice for this structure there are 10 electrons now associated with the phosphorus, which is possible for phosphorus. Phosphorus can expand its octet. You're also going to notice that there is a single double bond here. So in truth, we should be drawing three more resonance structures. One with a double bond here, a double bond here, and a double bond here if we were to do this correctly. But what I'm hoping you gain from this video is not that you're going to have to verify and check every single structure according to formal charge but rather a step-by-step -step procedure as to how we can approach drawing a three-dimensional structure given the formula of a molecule or a polyatomic ion. First, using the electron counting method. Second, drawing the two-dimensional structure. Third, identifying the molecular class and shape. And fourth, drawing the final three-dimensional structure. And then, if you happen to verify it on the internet and it doesn't look exactly like the structure that you have found, either A, double check your internet source to make sure it's legitimate, or B, see if you can try formal charge to explain the structure that you found. Thanks for watching.